bring together training and service providers, employers and educators, and for 12 regional summits across the state to learn more about the unique challenges and opportunities in each area. The summit's findings, which you'll hear more about in a minute, identify some common themes that can guide our state agencies and our partners as we work together to strengthen the workforce development system and better meet the needs of Vermonters and Vermont businesses. I had the privilege of attending a few of these events, and what I saw was encouraging. Uh, they were very uh, proved to be uh, fruitful and worthwhile to attend. Because it's important for all of us to remember that there's so much more going on outside this building to solve problems and help people than most realize. In every community, people are working to, to match providers with the skills they need to be successful in today's workforce. These local efforts are key to ensuring our work at the state level learns from, builds upon, and enhances the efforts and ingenuity of these uh, on the front lines. That's key to bringing about real change. And I'm thankful for the over 600 people who participated in these summits. Your engagement, the hard work that you do every day to serve your fellow Vermonters will carry us into the future where our workforce and economy will be stronger than ever before. So at this point, I'd like to invite uh, our Commissioner of Labor, uh, Commissioner Harrington, uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. In 2018, the legislature explored workforce development efforts across the state and found that there were many agencies and groups already working to improve Vermont's workforce, and that the players and programs changed from region to region and town to town. Tasked the Commissioner of Labor with redesigning the system and aligning efforts for employers, job seekers, stakeholders, and service providers. As part of the process of implementing Act 189, the Department of Labor, the State Workforce Development Board, and other state agencies developed a five-part plan to improve collaboration, coordination, and alignment of stakeholders around the state's workforce vision and goals. One distinct effort of this plan was to host the 12 regional convenings or summits throughout the fall of 2019. Through a competitive bidding process, the Department of Labor secured a qualified consultant to help develop, promote, and manage this series of standardized workforce summits. There were over 10 proposals submitted from both in-state and out-of-state consultants. A proposal review committee came together comprised of core partners and reviewed the proposals and selected a collective proposal by the Vermont Regional Development Corporations. The development corporations were chosen because of their community-based experience, their understanding for regional partners and stakeholders that we wish to engage with through this process, and the unique dynamic that employers and employer needs have in each of our existing counties. At the same time, the department saw an opportunity to deepen its relationship with the regional development corporations in addressing workforce challenges across the state. The department asked a lot of the development corporations, and in that work related to the summits included facilitating the convenings and cross-training activities, soliciting and collecting targeted feedback to inform the development of Vermont's 2020 Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act plan. <coughs> this will also guide workforce efforts over the next five years. Provide employers with state and local tools and information about how and where to access resources to help them meet their labor force needs and to create a directory of local workforce education, training, providers, programs, and relevant resources. We are extremely happy with the work the development corporations did and are still analyzing the 150 page plus report and data that they collected throughout the fall of 2019. This information will be used to assist our department and the State Workforce Board as we design initiatives that support each of Vermont's 251 towns. Additionally, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to the Regional Development Corporations, the State Workforce Board, and all those who participated in this process. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Fred Kinney, Executive Director of the Addison County Economic Development Corporation, to say a few words. Fred? Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Harrington. Um, I am Fred Kennedy, Executive Director of the Addison County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, ACEDC acted as the lead regional development corporation on this project, but I'm here representing all 12 uh, regional development corporations, most of whom are 
represented behind us, uh, the other directors from around the state. Um, Governor, the, the RDCs of Vermont uh, appreciate your administration's support and the support of the General Assembly for economic de development, especially in the area of workforce development. The RDCs uh, were pleased to respond to the Department of Labor's RFP to convene 12 standardized workforce summits around the state. It made sense for us, and I dare say we forged some new partnerships with and among some of the Department of Labor's core partners that we normally don't uh, work with. Uh, one purpose of the summits was to provide a two-way lane of communication, one down from the state level to the regions and another back up to the state level. So we provided a venue to listen locally and report back up. Um, our report on the summits identifies actionable strategies specific to each region that will be implemented locally by the formal or informal workforce partnerships that have evolved in each region, such as the Addison County Workforce Alliance in my region. It also identifies five common statewide themes and prioritizes seven strategies to inform state-level discussions. The Department of Labor has accepted our report and will be reviewing and considering our recommendations as they develop the state's workforce strategies and goals. While the report marks the end of the scope of work for the summits, the RDCs look forward to continuing this private-public partnership with the governor, the Department of Labor, the State Workforce Development Board, and other core partners to create new ways to do workforce development and build an integrated workforce system. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> with that, uh, we'll open up to questions, uh, maybe on the subject first, and, uh, and feel free uh, to ask anyone who's here uh, any questions you might have, and, and anyone who's here who might want to add something uh, that we might have missed. Uh, please feel free to come up and share your thoughts and hear from the state. Is there anything that we can do uh, beyond what we're doing? I think we yeah. plan on it. Just, uh, keep putting pressure on the, on the federal government, doing everything we can. Again, uh, with our congressional delegation, we've made those uh, those initiatives known uh, as well. So we're hopeful uh, that we can make some gains in this area. If the federal government, you said you're pushing back on the federal government? Well, we've, uh, we, we've you know, when there was a... Um, a request uh, for different uh, states and so forth uh, to, to sign on uh, to different, you know, whether we wanted uh, more refugees in our states and communities. Uh, we, we said yes, uh, by all means. Uh, so we sent the letter back. Uh, we've been asking again, I've uh, sent a couple of letters uh, to the uh, administration uh, asking uh, for more refugees uh, in, our, in our communities. Uh, there's been a change. Uh, in leadership, uh, so, so there's been uh, different uh, different commissioners or secretaries uh, in those. We haven't received a lot of feedback uh, from those letters, but we'll continue to, to do whatever we can to advocate for that because I think it's important. What do you think the biggest obstacle is to having this materialize the way that you would like it to? Well, I think it's, again, uh, it's the federal government and, um, and President Trump in particular uh, that uh, that has not been as inclined to to accept more immigration. It's been a big policy shift uh, in our in our country. So um, uh, I think that's a bit of an obstacle to the administration. And a lot of Republican governors have been reluctant to take advantage of the opportunity President Trump has given them to to close the door. Uh, and I, I would think that has something to say about how governors, even Republican governors, view the economics of, of resettlement. Yeah, well, and, and yeah, I, I think there are a number uh, of uh, governors, Republican, Democrats, uh, governors who, who see the value uh, and, and see the need, uh, especially in the Northeast, uh, in the northern uh, part of our, our country. Uh, we have uh, tremendous uh, workforce needs. We need more people in our state. Uh, this is a, a way, uh, and we've been successful in, in, uh, in our refugee populations, particularly in the Winooski area, Chittenden County area, uh, but uh, we'd like to see that grow. Could, could you talk a little bit more about concrete results from the summits that took place last year and, you know, what, 
know what this is actually doing in terms of new businesses hiring well, people from out of state or from in state? Are, are there some initiatives from this report? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we just received the per report, right. um, okay. and we're hoping to put some of that into place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and but uh, a lot of uh, what we heard, I think, is important uh, that we uh, get outside this building. Uh, and and I've said this whether it's our capital for a day or some of the, the things that I do traveling throughout Vermont and listening to people. Our expectation uh, is that uh, if you have a problem, come to Montpelier, tell us about it, and we'll see if we can fix it. Well, sometimes getting out and really engaging with uh, communities uh, gives us an opportunity to see what they need. Uh, and we heard loud and clear uh, that workforce challenges uh, uh, exist th throughout Vermont. Uh, so that's probably uh, not a surprise. But again, learning, getting everyone together uh, and sharing uh, a common goal and learning from other uh, RDCs and other uh, regions of the state, I think will prove to be um, essential as we move forward uh, in trying to do this, uh, pulling in the same direction that I talk about a lot. Uh, but I think we, we learned it here, learning from one another. But I'll let, uh, if there are other uh, RDC members who would like to speak to that, uh, come up and re reflect on that would be, be helpful. Sure. I can add one thing that, um, uh, you know, our report was the Department of Labor, and they, they'll be looking at the five themes that we presented, the priority potential strategies. But each region also developed um, strategies for their region, and um, the RDCs will be taking those forward in their region. For, in, as I mentioned, in my region, we have Addison County Workforce Alliance, which grew up, um, evolved, um, you know, just among people who need, thought, uh, felt the need to have an organization to kind of be the, the bond between all the partners in the region. So we'll take, we have a lot of strategies we can, that were recommended by employers and service providers in our region, but we're definitely going to take five of those and try to move those forward in our region. Um, and that's, you know, that will involve those service providers, educators, and employers all together working on those strategies. What, what, if you had to, if Fred pointed the most, what you think is the most exciting proposal or recommendation out of this report that you've just submitted, that's going to move the ball forward on mm -hmm. this issue, what, what is it? Uh, well, I don't know if I want to pick one out as the most important, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, just uh, s developing somehow um, new regional leadership. Um, and so that each region has somebody that's daily working on workforce development. It's one of the, was the first theme that we came up with, and I think that's going to be important. Anybody has any other things to add? I'd like to add something. Sure. Uh, uh, to the question of, of refugees, uh, there's some, some great programs happening, very pilot-based around the state. So in, in Wyndham County, in uh, Bellows Falls, there's an organization called the Community Asylum Seekers Project, and they're helping asylum seekers relocate to Wyndham County. So there's projects like that popping up around the state. So they need more funding. It's a completely philanthropic-based program, and we're helping connect them with employers to try to ensure that there's both a, a system and a network to support their needs when they arrive, but also have uh, the ability to gain high wage, high growth uh, job opportunities. So I just wanted to share that. What's your name? Adam Mull. And who are you with? The Brown and Burl Development Credit Corporation. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to ask um, this may, may be you and maybe someone from uh, some other far flung outpost of the state, uh, southern Vermont, particularly of the kingdom. Uh, What's, what's the biggest disconnect between what's going on in your communities and what the state is doing or could be doing? You know, what's the opportunities we're missing or the roadblocks or what? I know that's a big question and I'm asking an amorphous group of people here, but if anyone has any thoughts they'd like to share about that, please. Rick, do you want to talk about the communication piece? Because that came in. Uh, Speak freely. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I want to come up here. It's really short. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, 
Jamie Stewart. I'm the executive director for Central Vermont Economic Development. Um, there, are, there are obviously uh, there were common themes that came out. Um, we all have to kind of digest some of that, and that's where that piece is in place. But the most common theme, and we've been hearing this now for a little while, is the communication. Employers knowing who to reach out to if they have this problem, they want to know how to find somebody who can support and address that problem. Um, for the service providers, getting their information out and how they can be a resource. And then service providers within that group, how can they coordinate their efforts? Because the state actually does, what we're finding, deal with a lot of the issues very effectively in many different ways. What I think will come out of this, and a big part of the process was in trying to develop that resource. And I would go back to Sarah Buxton and our initial meetings as we were developing this process. That was very much something that the Department of Labor and the Workforce Investment Development Committee are we're searching for was that ability for Vermonters to find the resources they need, and that's from the employer side, from the service provider side, from the job seeker side. Oh, the old silo problem. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And while we were, we were able to put together a rudimentary uh, service provider directory that we gathered from all the um, all the convenings, there needs to be a next step to that so that it's you know with an interface that's usable by clients and by employers, so they can look at they can approach it with a problem. I have I have this problem, you know, I, I, um, and find the right resources that way instead of just having a list to look at. Um, so that, that's kind of a next step we think to um, to this project. I'm uh, Bill Colvin. I'm the uh, director in Bennington County of the uh, RDC. I think we ought not lose sight of the value in this process itself. I think Commissioner uh, Harrington touched on the strengthening connection between the Department of Labor and the Regional Development Corporation. The governor has spoken about the importance of having boots on the ground for communication uh, up and down. I think there was also real value amongst the RDC in establishing this process. It provided a real opportunity for the RDCs to learn positive practices from one another about what's happening in the region. So I think there are opportunities to further support what's happening regionally. I think this process in developing the report, convening the summits, aided that significantly. Other questions on this subject? <laughs> is, is there, the re, I assume the report is will be up somewhere or it's, is up? If you'd like to, yeah, it's, it's many 150 pages. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, we'll be able to get you copies if you want to be online. Or if it's online, yeah. It will be online, but I can send around the link on DOL for a site. Some of the department of labor. Do you want to take a shot for more? Sure, yeah. Take all the time you want. <laughs> I'm Bob Haynes. I'm the director of Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation, Windsor and Orange County. We're all focusing on, on education issues as well uh, and trying to introduce uh, the notion of careers to younger people. So we're, we're trying to start programs in elementary schools, junior high schools, and not wait for, for people to grow um, beyond uh, their ability to, to think seriously about a career that might be exciting. There are thousands and thousands of terrific jobs, and it's frustrating for us when we, when we find um, instances where young people in particular can't get connected with a good job. So it relates to the communication, but the education is, is critically important. Our regional technical centers are extremely valuable. We are all advocating for much more support for them and, and more abilities for students who intend to follow a career in college, maybe get exposed to some of the other options and vice versa. So thank you. Can I add something to um, I'm Brett Long. I'm Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Economic Development. And I wanted to kind of follow on your question. Uh, because there's a lot going on that winds up below the radar. And something that just developed recently that might be interesting to address that is um, through convenings, such as what has happened here, we had a group of businesses come together that were interested in trying to develop um, capabilities and frankly, just understand um, additive manufacturing or deposition printing, as it's sometimes called. And over uh, quite a long process, we wound up getting a federal grant from an area of the Department of Defense in which we were able to work with uh, VTC, Vermont Technical College, and through that, they have recently completed the development of an additive manufacturing curriculum 
and this um, term have started to add that course or offer that course. And the second part of this grant is to actually get these businesses together and allow them to uh, have access to deposition printing equipment so that they can try out prototype and do R&D in this new um, area. And what's interesting is through that convening of businesses, um, it looks like this group is going to evolve, evolve into a group that's actually pursuing all areas of advanced manufacturing, robotics, AI, um, working on cybersecurity together. So just the fact, as people have said, that you're able to get these, a group together, it winds up with all kinds of uh, ancillary benefits. Thanks. Anyone else? So uh, my job is to pick the one that I think can lead uh, in the best way. And I thought he was the one that could. Haven't you said you want to get more women in senior sure. justice positions? Sure. How, how does that help that cause? Well, I think you, if you look at my track record, I've, been, I've appointed a number of, uh, of female uh, uh, candidates for different positions. I just, I just chose a, a, a sheriff in Orleans County, a female sheriff uh, in that uh, district, uh, and which is the only one who is serving at this point in time. Um, and I appointed a uh, state's attorney in Caledonia just recently as a female. So it isn't it's something that I always keep in mind. Uh, but again, I want to choose the right candidate that has the expertise uh, that can that can move uh, that agency forward or, or whatever I'm uh, choosing them to, to, uh, to serve in. We'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll let it go through the process. I don't want to get ahead of that. Um, but the, you know, my feelings haven't changed on minimum wage. I think I've been uh, quite vocal about it in a couple of different campaigns, as well as uh, over the last uh, three years uh, as, uh, as governor. Um, so I have concerns, um, but, uh, but I'll reflect on, on what it is uh, that passes and, and then determine my action from there. Well, considering how you feel about it, Yes. Yes, I am. Saturday night. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rebecca said that the, your deadline was Saturday night at midnight. Eleven <laughs> fifty-nine. It'll, it'll be before that. <laughs> Just going back to the minimum wage yes. for a second. Understanding your concerns when it was fifteen dollars an hour over a five-year period. This is less. It's a shorter period of time. Um, Same trajectory. Uh, doesn't go as far, right? Same projection. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> do you, are your concerns uh, eased at all by the fact that it's not quite as comprehensive as the previous plan, or you're saying, you know, I had these problems with it before, and I still haven't had? I'm still concerned about the rural parts of our state uh, and what this means. This one size fits all is uh, is very difficult when we have two different economies in Vermont, and you don't have to go very far. A convenience store, let's say, uh, up in uh, Ludenburg, for instance, is far different than the convenience store in downtown Burlington or in Williston or in, or in Shelburne. Uh, and, uh, and what may not have much of an effect on the daily traffic uh, through, through those stores and, and the amount of revenue that's generated in, in, their, uh, in their world, it's much different than Lunenburg or Concord or, or pick any other uh, small community, uh, Ridgeford. Um, so many, so many other uh, factors. So I'm concerned, still concerned uh, about that. Um, albeit, it's uh, it's about half of what they wanted, but it's half the timeline as well. And I, I go back to, and I've said this before. I go back to when I was in the Senate, and we uh, I we had the debate on uh, raising the minimum wage, and and I was convinced to, to move forward on that because uh, it, it tied it to the cost of living. Um, and uh, it raised it uh, at that point in time. But the argument was, we'll never have to deal with this ever again if we pass it today. And this will mark the third time uh, that action has been taken on this issue. So I believe supply and demand works. I believe the wages are rising. I think the shortage of uh, labor in Vermont uh, is, uh, is having an effect on that, and, and their employers have to compete. 
but every region is different economically. Would it be advisable to have a separate minimum wage pricing system in Burlington as opposed to the rest of the state? Well, Should we have a higher minimum wage in Chittenden County? Than certainly in, uh, in the, the Bur greater Burlington area, mm -hmm. uh, the economy is much different. And I think that they could absorb it uh, much, mm -hmm. much easier. Uh, than the Northeast Kingdom or other parts of the state. So, would you recommend that that we have two separate? Uh, I, I think ranges? that was uh, that was put forth. I believe that Senator Benning uh, might have mentioned that uh, in one of the previous bills, uh, mm -hmm. but it didn't get uh, a whole lot of traction. So, it sounds like you, you're inclined to veto the bill that's going to be heading your desk. Well, we'll see. Uh, but uh, but again, I uh, I made my feelings known. I still have concerns, uh, but we'll, we'll see. If they stretched it out another couple of years, would that be more palatable for you? I want people to make more money in Vermont, um, but uh, but our economy uh, is is, uh, is is sensitive at this point in time, uh, and I believe that our businesses in some areas of the state uh, are under a lot of burden. Uh, so I just want to be careful how we move forward. Uh, but I would uh, I would entertain uh, a number of different proposals in order to massage uh, the wages in, in some way, but, uh, but I still believe uh, that the supply and demand works. Democrats view this bill as a compromise. Do you see this bill as a compromise? Again, it, uh, it only compromises. It's halfway to what they want it to be. Um, Is that it's, a it's halfway. It's halfway. In the, it's the same trajectory. It's the same thing. And next year, I, I'm sure those uh, same folks uh, that say it's a compromise are probably writing a bill right now to raise it to $15 in two more years. What do you mean by the same trajectory? Because to my understanding, the, in order to get to 15, uh, this system, we wouldn't get there until around 2030. Yeah, but I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, if you came to the trajectory of the 15, uh, what was proposed initially, um, it was a four year, four to five year um, uh, time frame. Um, if you take that trajectory and look at what they, they just shortened the time period and it goes to 12 to 50. It's the same same trajectory. Right, it's a much longer time. But, yeah, but I'm saying that they're going to get in two years. They're going to get to the same point uh, as the 15, and then they're going to introduce more language and I, I, That's my thing. Have you issued an RFP for the paid leave? Yes. Uh, any response? Uh, not yet. Uh, we'll, we expect them in the next week or two. Yeah. So you are, as you consider this paid leave bill that was sent to you, to actively moving forward with the voluntary? Absolutely. Because I think it can be, be done much more quickly. We negotiated with the, uh, the uh, employees, the state employees, uh, the union. They accepted the proposal. And so we have 8,500 people uh, that we, uh, we have the, the pool now to start with. So uh, I believe it's the most efficient, effective way to do this without a $29 million payroll tax. Um, there's a piece of legislation that would uh, create a mandate for the law to make certain emission reduction targets. Um, how do you feel about changing, going from visionary goals to an actual legal requirement? Yeah, um, well, I've said, uh, I think what we ought to do is take a lesson from what we learned uh, with water quality. And if we could, uh, if we could assess what we're doing today, uh, and then determine what, what our needs are, uh, how much it's going to cost, and then determine how we're going to pay for it, I think we'll get to the same point, and we'll do it together. Uh, and water quality, again, we we now have a 20-year plan uh, for water quality. Uh, we have a, a, some dedicated sources of, of dollars uh, to to fulfill that, uh, and it's about a billion dollars. Uh, so. I think that's the best approach uh, for this initiative, and, and I believe that they're they're moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, but we'll see. I, setting uh, artificial or, or these goals um, that that could be challenged uh, could just take resources away from the from uh, the climate initiatives themselves. What do you mean they could be challenged? Well, I think if you don't meet them, um, because again, I, I've said that I believe uh, meeting. Most of our emissions at this point in time uh, that we that I'm concerned about are transportation related, um, and I think uh, that's not a straight trajectory. I think that the behavior is going to change, competition, technology, everything's going to change. But I bet within 20 years, uh, most of the vehicles will be either uh, electric or 
or maybe hydrogen or something of that nature. But, um, but that trajectory is going to be like this, not straight. Uh, and so if you put something in place uh, that doesn't meet that, then there'll be a challenge from some uh, environmental group, a lawsuit, and, and take resources away from, from the initiative itself. And, and I believe that we can, we can do this much more effectively if we go into it uh, with, the, with the goal in mind of what we want to do, but then figure out how we're going to get there. You mentioned you used clean water as an analogy. Was it not a legal requirement? in the form of the TMDL that forced Vermont to have that conversation well, and resulted in the action that yeah, I mean, it's, it jump-started, no doubt about it, jump-started the conversation. So um, we, but, but, the, but then we, we came, but we came to the conclusion, if we're all on the same page and we want it to happen, let's talk about, again, what we're doing today, what we need to do, how much it's going to cost, and how we're going to get there. And I think that that's a much more effective way of, of doing business than then it's set a, a goal that we, we're not sure if we can meet or not, and, and uh, then leave it up to future legislators and future administrations to adhere to. I mean, that's not leadership. Why are you, what concerns you about the mandate specifically? Because we don't know, again, how we're going to get there. And, and again, my, my trajectory, I think it's different. I think that it's going to be much steeper in the, in the years to come, 10 years from now, technology changes. And, and all these car manufacturers come out with their EVs and it's competing against each other and there's more acceptance and we have more charging stations, then we'll, we'll, it'll be a steep climb up from there, but we'll get there because I think that the competition will drive that. Um, You're saying the state but, doesn't but, need to do it. But I think you'll, you, you might miss that. You might have an artificial goal that you can't hit because you don't have uh, either the vehicles, the charging, whatever it is, you might not hit that. And then you see that open yourselves up uh, to lawsuits uh, that, again, take away from the initiative. So you think that the free market is the solution to climate? Well, it's part of it, but we have to lead by example, which we're doing. I mean, some of the, many of the initiatives I've taken uh, over the last two or three years uh, with, with trying to incentivize the EVs, uh, more char charging stations. We had a press conference this week with buses, electric buses. We two in the, in the Burlington area. There's two more coming here. There's been some in the schools. That opens up the door to all kinds of different initiatives. And again, it's, it's endless. What might happen is not just about the transportation. Then you might be able to utilize some of these vehicles. So you think about buying parking lots full of uh, electric buses, for instance. That's a, a huge power supply in itself that when they're not being used, could be used to shave some of the peak power. I mean, it's just, there's all kinds of things that we can consider in the future. Do um, these electric buses, though, point out a problem? I don't know, I forget the price tag. Is it a million dollars? A million dollars, um, and, and for a diesel now, it's like 650. So for a million dollars, you had $3 million in your budget for uh, EV subsidies and charging stations, right? So, I mean, that would be three buses. So, uh, sure, but those prices, those prices will come down uh, as technology again changes, as competition drives drives that those prices down. When they have different more bus companies building these these uh, buses, and they become more commonplace, the price will come down. I think the argument uh, against the your trajectory is that because the longer we wait, the longer that it takes for yeah. that ski slope to go up. The more emissions we're pumping out, the worse the problem gets. We need to take more action to push that trajectory. Agreed. Earlier. Agreed. I, but I think we should take action like we're doing now. Um, we have to prepare ourselves for that. We need the infrastructure, charging infrastructure, for instance. And it, the whole game really is in battery storage. That's the whole game. And so technology is changing every single day. The life of batteries has, has exceeded uh, expectations. And there's a competition to see who gets there first. So if it's a, if it's a different type of battery technology uh, that we don't even think about, it, it's not, it probably won't be lithium. It'll be something else. Uh, and if we can extend the life or the, 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 the longevity uh, of, uh, of that storage, so instead of having a vehicle that has uh, gets 200 miles uh, per charge, you have one that has uh, six or 800 miles uh, per charge. That makes it much more feasible, and 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 it's exciting in some respect. It, it's the the new age. Uh, the, it's almost like the industrial revolution, only it's the electrical evolution.
some, some Vermont towns have been considering declaring themselves um, Second Amendment sanctuary cities. Um, I know at least four or five already have some more considering town meeting day. Um, I'm just curious, do you have any um, sort of advice for towns or voters who are considering declaring that they are subject to state or federal laws? That they yeah, I think, they, I think most of them realize that uh, uh, when they take that action. It's just uh, advisory in nature. And, it's more of a statement. statement. Well, do you, I, but I, I think there are some people who, who think it goes a little further. Oh, right. Well, I don't, I, you know, state and federal law prevail. So that's your advice. I guess I'm asking do you have any advice to these voters who are considering these measures? Well, I think that, you know, if they have the sentiment on the local, local level, I just think they should be advised. That my advice is uh, make sure that they know uh, that uh, state and federal law is going to prevail in, in these issues and that they're not going to be isolated. Uh, and, uh, and and do whatever they want to do. Uh, they have to adhere to the state of the law. You expressed concern about uh, what a TCI agreement could look like and how that could raise prices for for monitors and the gas pump, et cetera. What would it take for you to support a TCI agreement? What would you need to see? What would you need to well, be on the table? You know, the overall uh, cost, from my perspective, of anything we do uh, is a concern. Uh, we have a limited pool of resources. I think we have to prioritize what we need and what we want and, and make sure that we live within that, uh, those resources. Uh, I believe like the water quality. I mean, when we first started having that conversation, uh, most of the talk wasn't about what we do for projects. Most of the talk, at least in this building, was what tax we're going to raise, right? So I said, I think we could do it within, uh, within resources that we have. Let's grow the economy and we'll have the resources in order to, to pay for it. Well, guess what? We did. I mean, we, we came up with a source, an existing source. We didn't have to raise taxes to do it. We're dedicating that to water quality. I feel the same way in this area because to 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 get uh, to get to a point like I believe again that within 20 years, most of the vehicle, 90 percent of the vehicles are going to be EV or hydrogen or something other than uh, an internal combustion engine. If you believe that, as I do, then you know that the resources that you can you can reap from uh, a carbon tax of some sort uh, is going to fall off because we're not going to be utilizing as much. So why not just accept, prioritize what we want and need, uh, and see what we can live without? And, and if this is our highest priority, I put um, I put resources towards this in, in my budget. Then let's just do it. You were the U.S. Senate right now. Would you want to hear testimony from John Bolton for having a labor yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I've said before, uh, I have faith in this process. When I say that, uh, I believe that uh, most Americans want to have faith in this whole process. So I think that that includes uh, hearing as much testimony as necessary to come to this conclusion, whatever conclusion you're going to come to. Um, this is a, an important time in history. Uh, we shouldn't take this lightly, and we should we should have all the we should have all the testimony we need in order for them to make the right decision, and we can feel good about the process. So, did, does that mean you want to hear? Yeah, John Bolton. Sure, speak? absolutely. When you vetoed the 24-hour gun waiting period last year, um, you had cited a lack of research showing that it was effective. Um, I think last week, two Harvard Business School professors came and testified that um, longer waiting periods do work. And I'm just curious, given there's more research showing that some longer periods might work, would you be inclined to support 48 or 72 hour? Again, uh, my feelings haven't changed. We, we took some historic steps uh, just a couple of years ago in terms of gun legislation in the state. Uh, some of the provisions within that legislation, like red flag provision, I think could be effective in some of uh, counter, uh, counteracting some of uh, the suicides we're seeing in Vermont. Uh, one of them is if someone's in uh, harm to themselves or others, uh, they would have their guns taken away from them. So uh, I think we also should improve the NIC system within that so that if someone is, uh, uh, the red flag provisions are, are uh, put into the next system so that someone can't buy uh, uh, another weapon. So I think we can make some improvements within, within that. I think we need more education. I don't think everyone realizes uh, how you can utilize uh, the red flag laws uh, that we have now. And I would also ask, uh, and I, I hadn't, I did, 
I would also ask uh, the experts from Harvard if they have compared states that have red flag laws uh, and, and have they done any research on, on how that uh, effect of that has been. And when they when they say that the 24 or 48 or, or whatever or three day wait, waiting periods are, are more effective, have they compared them to states that have red flag uh, provisions now? Well, would that change your calculation at all, given that if you were thinking 24 hours doesn't prove to be effective, longer proves to be effective, research shows no, that I, change? I, again, I, I believe the laws we have that we passed two years ago uh, are sufficient, and we should, we should improve upon those and make sure that uh, everyone knows how to utilize them, uh, and then uh, continue down this path as well. And uh, as far as suicides, are concerned uh, in my budget <coughs> investments and, and more suicide prevention. So that's the, the track I'm taking, um, and I'm not inclined to do anything more. In your uh, budget address, um, allocating some five and a half million dollars to the ACO under the um, pretense that they become a nonprofit. Um, I guess right now, state and federal law are kind of clashing, like they have to be a, a for profit right now. I guess sort of what, what are your thoughts on that going forward? And then how that's possible. If, if, um, if they can't, if in some way they can't become a nonprofit, um, they have to become more transparent. I think that's the point. Um, it's not the nonprofit status as much as the transparency status that they have to adopt um, because we want to know what's going on. There's a lot of money that goes in this. I happen to believe, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic as far as. Uh, how uh, this would uh, would help uh, in, uh, in at least <laughs> changing the, the trajectory of uh, healthcare costs uh, in our state. Um, so uh, we just need to, to make sure that we all understand what we're doing. Does that level of transparency extend to salaries? I think it, it should be just like a yeah. I, I mean, when I say um, if they can't go to to a nonprofit status. Mm -hmm. They should adopt all the transparency uh, that's uh, available through a nonprofit, and, and that includes salaries, I believe, in, in nonprofits. So, are you recommending that that be written into statute? Um, either an agreement. I don't know how it would work, to, to tell you the truth. Uh, but my goal would be that they become more transparent. If it, if it leads to something in statute, uh, I would be open to that as well. But I would hope that there would be some sort of agreement uh, that could be done much easier. Is the Green Mountain Care Board adequately providing kind of oversight you believe uh, is um, necessary for performers to understand how some of these large monopolies like the Green Medical Center and Long Care are operating in the state? Yeah, well, certainly, um, whether it's the Green Mountain Care Board, there has to be oversight of some sort, and it used to be uh, through banking insurance uh, that. Uh, that had oversight before. There needs to be oversight in some capacity. So should it go to DFR then? It could. Mm -hmm. um, that could be a, a way forward. The Green Mountain Care Board's mission has changed uh, since single payer has been taken off the table. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the Green Mountain Care Board will need to change as well. Do you think that the Green Mountain Care Board has become one of those state agencies that is both regulating and promoting? and therefore has a built-in conflict of interest? Um, I, I'm not sure that they have a conflict of interest. I just think their mission has changed. Uh, when in the, the inception, it was going to be a single-payer system, and, and now that isn't the case. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not... That hasn't been the case for six years. Right. <coughs> right. But we didn't get to that point uh, until maybe three years ago. Your, bu your budget book cited uh, $13 million in savings from sort of pivot and other administrative reform efforts. Um, are you satisfied with the results of the program? Ne never uh, completely satisfied. I think we can always improve uh, every single day. Um, it's part of you know, my background in business. Uh, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't look for an opportunity to become more efficient, more effective, uh, more productive. And uh, I feel the same way in state government. It's an ever-changing process, but every day, every day, uh, we should be looking at ways uh, to try and save money and become more efficient with the taxpayers' dollars. Well, way back when, when we both had less gray hair, you were talking about the potential for you know lean management and things like that. 
to free up money to do other things in state government, do you think it's had those that level of results? Well, I, I think the, the rent or rebate uh, program is a prime example uh, of that of working uh, because it was an inefficient process. Uh, many, many uh, just didn't apply because it was so rigorous and, and so difficult to get through. Uh, and it costs a lot to, to implement. So they've streamlined the process, they saw that, uh, freed up, I think it's 800,000 more dollars to, to put back into the pockets of those who need it. So uh, it wasn't that we, we took those savings, it was that we uh, were able to, to give that back so those who are renting uh, that are uh, burdened uh, can, uh, can take advantage of that. There's a, a bill that would require a little diversity in State House Park. Um, I mean, looking around this room, a lot of white guys featured. Do um, you feel like women, people of color should be featured more prominently in the state house portrait? I think, I don't know. I haven't uh, really heard about the bill, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but, uh, but we can't ignore uh, some of the history either. I mean, these, uh, unfortunately, uh, there wasn't as much diversity then. But hopefully in the future there will be, and then we'll see uh, more. Uh, across uh, across the halls of, of this uh, of this institution. So you don't think there were any email? I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were. And, and I think we should highlight them. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I, but I I'm just saying uh, that uh, as we move forward, we should learn from from history and, and do better uh, and provide for more diversity. And that's what I'm trying to do with my administration. Plans. My, my cabinet, extended cabinet, or some of the appointments I made, and not all of them, uh, but uh, but I'd say uh, a number of them. Um, it's important to me uh, that we have more diversity. But it some, sounds like you're comfortable with the. Well, I, I, I don't the honor. I don't retire. I don't determine the artwork in the in the state house. Um, this is the people's house, and uh, I'll let them uh, decide what they want to do in terms of artwork. If we can, uh, if we can highlight. Uh, more uh, diversity and, and throughout the state house, we should. I, I, I would have no problem with that. On the Indian Board of Trustees, they're also hearing uh, <clears throat> testimony about diversifying the Board of Trustees. I mean, I guess sort of what are your thoughts there is yeah. do we need to change? Well, again, I, I think we should keep that in mind in any board and any appointment that, that is made. Uh, they, uh, I, I applaud them for reflecting on that. Uh, but I think that uh, as well, uh, when some of uh, the legislature, uh, we make, uh, the legislature makes quite a few appointments uh, to that board, and they should reflect on that when they are, uh, are uh, making their choices. You make appointments to that board as well, are you going to be considering that? I, I will, absolutely. Uh, in every appointment that I make, I try and, I try and keep that in mind. Uh, Governor, any thoughts on the coronavirus and uh, what students um, or universities with international students should do to handle that potential threat? Yeah, um, well, our health department, we, we don't know many that I know of unless something's happened uh, today. Uh, obviously, we're, we're watching this because right across the, the river in New Hampshire, there are a couple of cases, or we think there are a couple of cases. I don't know if they've been confirmed at this point. Uh, so this, uh, this is something that we have to, to keep in mind uh, as well. I think uh, the message that uh, Dr. Levine, Commissioner Levine, uh, has sent uh, to, to many is to, uh, to make sure you're, you're protecting yourself, washing your hands, just like any uh, flu um, um, uh, issues of, of that nature. The, the same, uh, same holds for this as well. We'll we're watching this uh, and making sure that um, we, uh, uh, we do whatever we can to prevent this from spreading. Okay. 